Morning, everyone. Let's get the seminar started. Uh, good morning. Um, welcome to the next and last installment of the JKMRC Friday morning seminar series for the year. Um, and the seminars uh, take place here at the Interpili Le Lecture Theater as well as online. So good morning to everyone online. My name is Katerina and myself and Karina, who's taking care of the technical side of things today, um, have been the co-hosts of the seminar series this year. And we're taking turns introducing the speakers. Uh, like I mentioned, we are on our last seminar for the year, and the seminars will resume in February of next year um, at the commencement of the new school year. So before we begin, on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge all traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands of which we all meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize our valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Our today's speaker is Ian Neal, who is a mining executive with over 30 years of professional mining industry experience, and most recently as general manager with um, West Farmers Resources. He has diverse experience founded on tertiary qualifications in mining engineering and coupled with 18 years operations experience in technical and mine management roles, primarily in open cut coal mining in Queensland and um, New South Wales, including statutory mine manager responsibilities. Ian's extensive and unique senior and executive management experience has been gained with mine owners, major mining contract service providers, and major explosive suppliers. Ian is a director of industry bodies, including Australian Coal Research Limited, ACRL, which manages ACARP, the leading Australian black coal industry research and development program, including nearly two years as ACRL board chair. Other bodies that Ian is involved in the past or present um, include ACA Low Emission Technology, Minerals Council of Australia Coal Forum and the former Australian Coal Association, Queensland Resources Council and the Queensland Resources Ministerial Roundtable. Today's seminar is titled ACOP Research Program Update. Let's make Ian feel welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Karan. Mark's all good. Excellent. Well, thank you for allowing me to come along today. Um, I had a chat with Neville Plint a couple of months ago about trying to arrange one of these, and Neville's left the building already. Uh, <laughs> um, but I caught up with Rick recently, and uh, that's led to today's uh, seminar. Who's heard of ACARP? Excellent. Excellent. OK, we can all knock off. Uh, <laughs> um, I've been associated with ACARP for about 10 years. Um, I was a director and as Katarina mentioned, I was chair of the board for a couple of years. Uh, but when I uh, left West Farmers in 2017, I had to uh, give up a number of those industry uh, association board positions. And um, uh, a year or so later, I, I uh, took on the role as executive director. So I've been with the, the group now for another four years since July. Um, and I, as I was driving out here to the JK MRC, I reflected on uh, the fact that uh, my first visit here, I've been here a number of times, my first visit here was probably about 1990. Um, a guy called Andrew Scott. Anyone know Andrew? Yep. Andrew, um, Andrew was a technical services manager at Mount Thorley Mine and he left and came up to the JK MRC to look after explosives research and a few other things. And... Uh, actually took Andrew's job at Mount Thorley in 1989 um, and came up here to in about 1990 or 91 it may have been um, to for a full day session on uh, drilling and blasting research that was being undertaken by the JKMRC and um, that was under the NERDEC program and uh, that name will pop up in a minute because uh, NERDEC was the forerunner of the ACARP project. Um, so let me start. And um, press that button there, or click on that mouse there. We just need to make sure that it's in the screen. There we go. Um, so my agenda today is going to be a bit on makeup. So it's for, I'm probably speaking to some of the converted. I'll talk about how we fund 
um, both historical and uh, 2022's funding round. Unfortunately, I can't disclose today. I'd love to be able to say, yeah, fantastic, you've got an award. But our board meeting is on the 1st of December, and that's when we actually get to uh, recommend uh, to the board for approval um, 53 research projects, uh, and a number of those uh, are with UQ and um, associated bodies of the UQ. Uh, but we'll touch on uh, uh, the research that UQ has been doing over, say, the last five years, uh, really high-level stuff. So I'm not going to get into specific projects. And uh, as I was saying to Katarina, I've got a couple of slides there on tips on how to secure ACARP funding. Uh, it's always an interest when I do these presentations to uh, to uh, universities. And then just, just do a couple of bit of wrap-up. I've got, if I've got time, I've got a little bit of a... Um, uh, overview of the uh, the importance of the coal industry. Um, so I need to sort of go through that as well. So with that, yep, look at that, it works. So yeah, ACARP, um, it's the uh, Coal Industries Research Program. Um, it's probably should put the word black in there. It's, it's the black coal research. We don't do research on brown coal in, in Victoria. But 1992, uh, January of 1992, uh, that's just over 30 years ago now. Uh, so just prior to 1992, as I mentioned, I came here uh, and we did uh, work under the NERDIC program. Um, from 1978, uh, which is when I finished high school, um, to 1992, the federal government uh, had a program where they collected a tax on the coal industry for five cents a ton on coal production. And that money was to use for research and development for the coal industry, uh, primarily under the NERDEC program. Um, but in the, that 1990-91 period, the coal industry felt that they could self-manage that program. And after a, a fair bit of uh, negotiation with the uh, federal government, um, it was agreed that the federal government would suspend the tax uh, for two years and allow uh, a new company that was registered, which is Australian Coal Research Limited, who I work for, uh, to collect the money on behalf of the producers and to use that money for funding of research by CSIRO and universities, et cetera. And so we operated under that original memorandum of understanding in 1992 for two years. Um, it was a bit of a leap of faith by the government and I suppose the the industry saying we can manage this, um, uh, but it was quite successful. And for a number of years, the government e extended the agreement by, by letters. Dear sir, you can extend for another couple of years. And a new MOU was written in 2009 um, and another one in 2014. Um, and, and then I, I did the last one in 2020. Uh, so we've had four MOUs, but extensions all the way for 30 years now. Um, so it is, is quite a successful program. Um, the MOU now is between the federal government and the Minerals Council of Australia. And I, I do sit currently on the Minerals Council Coal Forum, which is like a, a committee of the board. Um, and the Minerals Council, um, we don't like using the the breakout name of ACARP, it used to stand for the Australian Coal Association Research Program, but now it's just called ACARP. Um, Australian Coal Association um, was discontinued in 2014, hence that new MOU was written in 2014 to, uh, to uh, include the Minerals Council of Australia. Um, every five years, um, so all producers that sell black coal, whether it's for local use or export, um, pay effectively me the levy. Um, and I'll, I'll go through that in a bit of detail. Um, the industry uh, determines what the research priorities are and they change over year. I gave a talk to the Australia Japan Coal Conference pre COVID, I think I can call it that. And I, I looked at our, the language in our research priorities from 20. Uh, 2000, no, 1992 through to 2018 or so. And in the early days, there was always this um, uh, background requirement for research in safe, safety, um, a little bit in the environment, 
But if I look at the open cut area, which was sort of my background, there was a fair bit on how to make drag line swing faster, how to blow the rock up better, uh, things like that. But over time, those uh, topic areas dropped away and uh, the majority of our research spend in the open cut sector these days is on environment, rehabilitation, sustainability, those sort of topic areas because they're the industry priorities. And uh, we keep looking at the priorities every few years. Um, at any one point in time, we've got about 250 projects on the go, about $80 million in, in value. Some of those are near complete, some are just, just launching. Um, and uh, in that 30 years, the industry has contributed over $400 million. So you can divide that by five cents, you'll come up with a lot of coal. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got about 2,000 research projects uh, completed, and that includes uh, on our website, we have access to all of those uh, NERDEC programs as well. And sometimes one plus one still equals two. So that research from 1980, or whatever, is still pretty valid. But as you guys would know, um, a lot of advances in technology over the 30, 40 years has allowed us to, to drill down and look at things differently. So sometimes when you do a research project, you might be reviewing previous research and go, well, now one plus one equals three because we've got some new tools or new ways or new thinking. Um, that's just a snapshot uh, on a quarterly basis, uh, except for the one month out on the right. Um, projects completed, projects starting. Um, typically, it's a bit of a peak in that first quarter of each of the calendar years because we, we do the majority of our uh, funding in, in the December board meeting. And then after Christmas, we start launching those kickoff meetings with the researcher and signing the research agreements and, and whatnot. So it's typically a bit of a peak there. Um, but uh, it's like a sausage factory. Because, you know, some projects might be three months. Some projects might be five years. Um, some projects might be for a lot of money and we stage gate them for two years because we don't want to award a $10 million project because that's going to take half of our budget. So we look at those in a different way. Um, this is a structure. Um, so we've got the MOU is a document between the Minerals Council and the Department of, uh, keep changing the name now, Industry, Science and Resources, um, uh, ACRL, company that I operate under. Uh, um, I have a deed of performance and agreement with the Minerals Council to do a number of things. Um, the operations centre, I suppose, is the research committee, which consists primarily of the two or co-chairs of each of those five technical committees. So the technical committees will look at research in underground or whatever, and of course they'll be pumping what they want to do in the underground space, but sometimes we need to moderate that a little bit because the underground is competing with the open cut for some funding and uh, the research committee will have that general debate and they make the recommendations that we should fund these particular projects to the board. Um, so the current MOU runs to the 30th of June, 2025. The earlier slide sort of talked about, we tend to do in five year increments and we will start the renewal process for that uh, probably late next year, this time next year. It's, it's, it takes about 18 months to, uh, to get the renewal process because I get the government on board then I get all the producers on board to say that the government's on board and flip and flop and ultimately we get there. Um, we're governed by a board and I'll, the board consists of uh, 15 directors, myself and 14 uh, uh, non-executive directors who are representatives of the um, coal producers. We've got copies of the slides. I think we'll, all that will be available. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I used to be a non-executive director. I was West Farmers Resources representative on the board for, for six years. Um, so as an as a organisation, we have a whole lot of, I'm not going to read through them, a whole lot of governance requirements. We're a company, we've got to have an audit. Um, um, we've got a constitution, um, a whole lot of governance arrangements. The key things there in the governance is, is probably a little bit down towards the bottom there is um, uh, volunteers from industry. 
they're the people who no doubt you guys are talking to when you're putting forward a project, you're a little bit of mentoring, um, but equally uh, when a project's awarded, we typically assign a minimum of two industry persons. Sometimes it's five or six or 10, depending on the interest level from the industry on that particular area or the complexities um, who will monitor each of those projects. So you're running 250 projects concurrently. You, you want a you know, minimum of two. That's just, you know, and some people do 10 projects, for example. But um, yeah, we, we have a large number of volunteers from industry, people who have got specific interests in environmental safety or roof bolting or whatever that topic area might be. Um, and they, they play a, a role in terms of uh, payment um, because the university might have requested $300,000 for that research project. There's certain milestone payments along the way. Uh, is the researcher on schedule? Well, the monitors will, will have that discussion and say yay or nay. And uh, if the answer is yes, uh, my administration team will each month will um, uh, sit with me and say, here's the billing cycle and we're going to approve all these payments. So you guys get paid. Or the university gets paid, you guys get paid anyway. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that's how it all sort of fits together on one slide. Um, we also have a number of task groups. Um, so we've got people from industry who are on the board, who are on the research committee, who are on the underground committee, who might even sit in the coal burst task group or the roadway development task group. And we've got some people who are just quite happy to be in the geotech task group. So they'll review projects coming in, they'll assist, they'll monitor, but they don't want to sit on committee structures or we don't want to put their hand up to be on the board, for example. Um, and those people are in this box at the bottom. So we've got 230 or so of those people who 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 are across various tasks there. It'd be great if we had a bit more. The industry uh, is continues to be in a state of um, uh, resource drain. Um, and trying to encourage younger uh, professionals, engineers, geologists, et cetera, to be on the committees um, because as people retire, there's that, there's that loss of, uh, of new blood coming in. That's, that's my problem um, that we're, we're working with industry on. Um, so how are we funded? Uh, typically about $20 million a year. Um, that's the chart. Um, I don't know if we'll get that little kick up in the FY23. That's my budget number. Um, the dip in the last two years is, is primarily associated with COVID uh, the impact on the mining industry. We were running around 450, 440 million tonne a year. Uh, last year, financial year ended June 2022, the industry did about 404 million tonnes. At the moment, we're we're a little bit below that number uh, after a couple of months. Um, we don't receive any government funding, unlike a lot of um, research programs. Um, the levy is still five cents. Uh, in my discussions with uh, the then minister when we were doing the renewal, he was, he was keen to increase that. Um, but underlying the MOU is a requirement for all coal producers to, to participate. So I had a a frank discussion with the minister and said, if you want to make it eight cents a tonne, well, I get more money to, to do more research. That's good. Um, you want to give me any. So I've got to go to the producers and that's a 60% increase. And if five, 10 producers say, no, I don't think I can afford that or see the value in that, I'd be sitting back with the minister saying, well, now I can't uh, uh, get hundred percent of the industry on board. So he, maybe reluctantly agreed, we'll keep it at five cents. But in that time period, we had been um, ramping up the volume, the industry had, um, up to 2018, 19. Uh, so we were keeping keeping pace with inflation. But a lot of, lot of um, research projects are supported by in-kind support by you know, CSIRO, universities, um, uh, private enterprise who are funding research, they'll say, yeah, I'm, I need $300,000 from ACAP for this project, but I'm not going to charge you for Fred and Harry. I'm not going to charge you for the, the laboratory services. They're all in-kind support. Um, we've got no way of um, auditing or validating that, but typically it's about $0.70 cents 
for one dollar of ACARP spend. Sometimes it's 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 you know dollar for dollar. Sometimes there's very little in kind support, uh, but uh, on average over you know that's probably an average over five years. There's probably three or four hundred projects in there. That's sort of the typical number, and that gives us a bit of confidence that um, uh, others are, are interested in that program. That's been our research um, spend, um, and uh, there's there's a slight difference between. Uh, what we actually spend each financial year and what we fund because uh, sometimes a project has slippage and they don't get paid, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, we took a decision, basically when I came on board in about 2018 or so on, in the role, we had accumulated a bit of funds and I said, and the industry, you know, tonnage is up. We need to ramp up our, um, our research expenditure. So... We've started to try and do that the last couple of years. We're hitting around that $20 million, $23 million. Um, we are a not-for-profit, um, so we want to not have this big accumulation of funds. We want to be able to put it back into, into research, and we're in a, probably in a pretty uh, comfortable position now by doing that effort. Um, again, I'm not going to read through that, but that's and it's probably a little bit dated, but... Um, that pie chart was just to try and demonstrate the, the range of um, uh, topic areas. So the ACARP program is so broad. You know, we might have five committees on open cut and underground, et cetera. We've also got them divided up into a whole range of tasks. Um, we're currently looking at some of that strategy at the moment. The last uh, four or five months, we've been looking at that in a bit of, bit of detail. And uh, that may change when we... Uh, release our research priorities in uh, early next year. Okay, our funding. Um, I'll, I'll do 2021 calendar year funding, which is awarded uh, December last year. Um, and I'll just touch on 2022 because we're about to award. Um, so 2021, the short proposals, um, no doubt a number of you guys put together a short proposal. The reason we ask for a short proposal in a particular format is because we get 260 or so. Previous year was 250. Um, and they're then divided up into open cut and underground and some crossover various committees. So they've got to go out to our, uh, our volunteers who have got day jobs. So we want them in a consistent form so they can put some to the left and some to the right. Um, and as you can see from the numbers, those short proposals were requesting $67 million. And I've got about 20 to give. So we've got to shorten them out. So the committees meet and do that and, and come up with the long proposal. The long proposal, it does require the researcher to provide more, more information, more work, um, but we don't want to waste the researcher's time on, on doing a long proposal for 260, knowing that we're not going to fund that number at the end of the day. So it's, it's proven it's, it's worth um, and last year we awarded 77, and now it adds up to six, 66 on the on the table there because it's the December um, grant. Uh, during the course of the year, we will do what we call out of round. And last year we did eight million dollars in out of round. Um, so they I, I can approve projects up to a hundred thousand dollars. Once it's been through a committee, so I've, I've got that delegated authority. But if it's over $100,000, it's got to go to the board for approval. Um, that's just our internal um, controls. Um, but sometimes a researcher might need a $50,000 extension for four months. And we don't want to wait until December to award that because we're in April and they've got the momentum, they're riding, and uh, for whatever reason, they just want to do a bit more work and, and extend their, their, their research. Uh, but they need some more funding. And so that that dialogue comes through the uh, the monitoring phase. That's then fed up as a request for the funding. And in that example, it'll end up on my desk and uh, the committees have reviewed it, I'll sign off on it. And that keeps the research and momentum going. Okay. Typically, a lot of the out around uh, fall into that extension type program. Um, but there are some some new ones that come up, and sometimes we commission particular researchers to do some work because we want to we want to do a little bit of foundation work before we get to that funding round. Um, 
press that button in. 2022, um, in March, we published our research priorities, a uh, 15 page or so document, uh, split up into those category areas. Sometimes those categories cross over, particularly in health and safety, uh, various committees. Um, we look at blue sky research. We look at you know pretty advanced research. Sometimes projects are uh, you know up to stage five or six. We've done quite a, you know go back quite a few years, um, and we're getting close to you know, the answer. And the answer might be um, you know, a demonstration plant or, or whatever. So um, that all seems to work. Um, um, where are we at the moment? Um, we're fairly well along the pathway. We this year we had uh, 205 proposals, a bit less than the last couple of years. Um, primarily in uh, about two thirds of our projects come from CSIRO and the universities and SIMTARS. Um, so one third's coming from, from small, medium companies, consultants, research, uh, uh, companies that want to do work not not associated with institutions I'll put it that way and we saw that group drop away this year um, perhaps they're, they're busy consulting to the mines rather than trying to write reports uh, but yeah the task groups uh, committees have been through their reviews um, we've done about 15 or 16 or so out of round funding uh, requests already this year um, Again, quite a few of those are just small extension type ones, but there was a, a plus $2 million project with CSIRO uh, that we signed off at the September board meeting, um, which is already in, the, in our bucket. December uh, 1st, that's when uh, the project will be awarded. Um, without naming particular projects, and these numbers may change, um, we're probably looking at about... Um, 53 projects to be awarded this year in December, 66 last year, slightly less. Uh, funding going to be about um, $14.5 million. Um, UQ, associated groups, JK, SMI, Mining 3, I sort of bracket you all in that. Um, yeah, you're punching, punching to your weight. Um, I'm expecting probably about... Uh, 15 projects to come come to the UQ, call it in group, uh, at the December board. So a bit under a third, which is um, pretty good. Our, it, it changes year by year, but um, between uh, uh, UQ, when I when I add in the mining three and all of that, uh, neck and neck with CSIRO in terms of um, our funding. We're fairly, I'll put a few charts up in a minute, but we're fairly... Um, I don't know, I'll say agnostic towards the university groups, but we do know that there's hubs of excellence at each particular university. Um, for example, we don't do very little, I think we don't have done any for a long time um, in the mine site greenhouse gas type stuff at UQ. Um, Newcastle Uni's got some pretty good facilities and people, CSIRO's got some pretty good facilities and people, so they tend to get most of that particular work, which is only typically three or four projects a year. Uh, but when, when I put a slide of a minute about where do we typically fund uh, um, to UQ, you'll, you'll probably feel fairly comfortable. Um, so yes, some, some good news, but there'll be some probably some sad news because uh, um, we're shortlisted to 80, 81 long proposals. Uh, that probably included about four or five that we We've recently done out of round. So come come say to 76, uh, 53 will be awarded. So there's going to be you know, roughly 20 or so uh, long proposals that won't get through. Budgets um, competing. I'll come to that bit later. There's the numbers. Um, who does the research in Australia? Um, well, CSIRO, universities, um, SIMTARS out at Ipswich Way. Um, as a companies and consultants make up about a third of our, our funding. Um, uh, other groups do research. Um, LITA, formerly a few different names there. Uh, ANALEC, 
Uh, they're, they're more specific in that uh, low emissions work. Up until about 2010, ACARP did, uh, did a bit more work in uh, fugitive emissions um, and then the coal industry decided to form um, uh, ACA, Australian Coal Association, Low Emissions Technology, known as ACOLET, uh, which had a name change to Coal 21, which then had a subsequent name change to LITA. Um, but that work, some of their work used to be done um, by ACARP. Um, the reason for the change, the industry felt that they needed more effort in that space. And that was, LITA was originally funded um, uh, up to 20 cents a tonne. And ACARP was getting five cents a tonne to focus on underground open cut coal processing, et cetera, et cetera. So we were only at a small amount we could allocate to, to that particular subject area. Um, uh, I suppose one, one solution could have been give ACARP 25 cents a tonne and ACARP split a heap of that off into that, but it was better to be managed by a, by a separate group. Um, Simtars, uh, safety in mine training. Um, it's it's part of the Department of uh, Resources here in Queensland. Uh, they do a lot of work in um, they do a lot of work for the mines in terms of ventilation monitoring. Um, they get involved in inquiries, uh, technical space. Um, but yeah, they also do um, uh, dust dust management. Um, so we, we that's the top typical area we fund in into Simtars. Yep, out at um, uh, near, um, so I think a suburb now, but near near Ipswich. Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, ACARP, um, we've been doing a little bit more of late in the pilot demonstration work. We've got a project with uh, Newcastle University uh, currently constructing a uh, small pilot plant at Ulan West Mine in, in the Upper Hunter Valley uh, to uh, use that for agglomeration of, um, of fine coal and, and tailings. And they've, they've done a lot of the, uh, the R&D in, in the laboratory, uh, but we want to see that more in the, uh, in the field now. So that's, a, that's about a $3 million project over a number of years. Uh, so quite a large one. Um, and we're doing a project with a company called Premron out of Gladstone at the moment. Um, and it's up to about stage eight. It started many years ago and it's in uh, underground continuous mining. Um, for those who have worked in underground uh, continuous mining, it's not quite continuous. Uh, the, the miner cuts the coal and waits for the shuttle car to come and take the coal away. And then has to pause because there's no surge. Then the shuttle car comes back, or his second shuttle car comes in. Um, this system is uh, is developing a uh, teardrop shaped conveyor that's hanging on a monorail right off the back of the con continuous miner. So the miner can continuously cut, and the conveyor belt can self extend and follow the miner, and it runs all the way back and can turn through 90 degrees and load onto the main conveyor. Um, Concept sounds simple. Um, they've, they've built systems, um, a demonstration on the surface. Um, we've had to change it to another mine site, so it's going through a reconfiguration, but uh, it, it'll be shipped up to the Anglo North Wurrumba North mine um, by Christmas and will then be uh, tested again on the surface and we expect it to go underground in June for six months. And uh, It'll be a product commercially available. Um, we're pretty confident of that. Yeah, we operate a little bit. We're moving around a little bit in that space, but uh, there's others who are right in the far end. We don't do any mark. You know, we've had companies come to us, um, not so much universities, companies saying, uh, "Please give me some funding. We want to write a business plan." We so sell. We operate under ATO class rulings and a whole lot of you know, uh, R and D eligibility requirements. Uh, so we say, well. You get a product that's come out of ACARP research. That's fantastic. Um, there's other groups called banks who provide funds. We don't provide funds for that. Yep. Um, UQ. So it's just a five-year snapshot. Um, it's not specific on individual projects. I'm looking at categories. Um, but in that time, 69 projects have commenced. Some have completed. And I'll come to that next slide. 
Um, and nine of those 69 are with mining three. Um, we issue from time to time PhD scholarships. I think we're up to about 22, 23 now. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight have come through University of Queensland and uh, Claire and Ben are the current uh, scholarship holders for UQ. Um, quite, quite a prestigious, we think, uh, scholarship. Uh, the requirements for that scholarship is that the persons have got to work in industry for a few years before they can you know, perhaps have a career change or want to take up that sort of opportunity. Um, uh, Nerida Scott, anyone know Nerida? Uh, Nerida did her scholarship uh, through ACARP and now Nerida is one of our what we call research coordinators for the coal preparation area. Um, so she works casually for, for ACARP. Um, um, but um, yeah, I think um, the scholarships, um, we, we do understand that uh, often when we're um, providing a um, uh, research funding to, to the universities that indirectly the university then engages a research assistant who is studying for their PhD or master's or whatever. So there's this flow on effect. Um, and when, when I did the renewal with the uh, federal government on the MOU, I, I made a bit of a story around that because um, as researchers retire, we want to see new researchers coming through. And so one of the one of the benefits of the ACAR program is that you know we're spending that sort of money through the universities. The universities are getting uh, other linkage programs to support that. Um, and uh, that's blooding new researchers who get new qualifications, et cetera. So it's a, it's a spin-off benefit. Um, uh, we also have um, uh, from time to time, industry research excellence awards. Um, and they're the last, I just trying to do the five year snapshot. Um, Joan had uh, received an award in 2018. Um, we didn't have any awards since then. We had a few attempts, uh, but COVID smashed us. And uh, um, yeah, a couple were awarded in uh, in September. Uh, we typically do about six or seven. Uh, I think this time was about 11 because we had a little bit of a catch up. And again, that's to recognize the researchers or the teams that are involved in that particular research. Um, um, and I think that's um, probably held in high regard by the by the individuals and, and the teams as well. Yeah. Um, so of the 69 projects, um, there's uh, about half of those are still on the go. And that, that doesn't surprise me because some of those might only started this year. Um, some of those might have started in, in 2020 and there for three years or so. So they're, they're, the sausage factory is, is producing. But yeah, we've got a um, you know, uh, third of them have, are complete and, and the other you know, 14 or so are near complete. Um, often the reports with our monitors who are working with the researchers saying, yeah, change a couple of words here in the report suite. Um, or there might be some other conversations. <laughs> but um, uh, as I said earlier, we... Um, We'll often stage gate if a project wants five or seven million dollars. We go well, you know, that's a third of our budget or a quarter of our budget. That's going to take away opportunity for others. So we're, we're happy to do one or two million on stage one, uh, and look how that works. And it is research. It might go down a dark alley, and that's where it ends. And uh, mentioned the Premrine run before up to stage eight uh, of funding. Um, so yeah, we've been through through some, some channels with them and, and coming out of the end of that. Um, some of the projects collaborate with other universities um, and we do a little bit of that through the short proposals. Um, UQ might put forward a proposal on coal processing and the uh, University of New South Wales put a yeah, similar sort of project together on coal processing. And, you know, one wants 300,000, one wants 250,000. Uh, sometimes we say, why don't you guys get your heads together and come back with a joint long proposal? Uh, it might be that, um, I'll, I'll just say it this way, that the smart person might be at UQ, but the better facilities at New South Wales University or vice versa. 
So, so we try and do that a little bit um, because we like what we saw, but we haven't got sufficient funds to fund both. Um, and uh, the linkage, the ARC, I sign off on a few letters there of support. I sign off on contracts. Um, the only criticism I have, and I'm being selfish now, is, is the timing of those things because we, we're sort of awarding in December and we might be anticipating having a kickoff meeting in February with the researcher, but the researcher wants to go for a linkage grant and they're awarded later in the year. So we get into this stall zone where I don't really want to start yet until I got my linkage program, but what if you don't? And so a year might go by before we actually launch that project and it will be you know, a burning need for the industry. So um, I haven't found a solution to that one yet. <laughs> Um, so this is a split um, by committee, okay? So of the 69 projects, eh, about half are in the open cut space. And I'll drill down into that in the next slide. Uh, underground, um, quite a lot of coal processing for UQ. Um, and a couple in the technical market support. I should describe that. Um, tech market support committee. Um, Primarily, they've, they've had two streams or substreams of work. Significant spend we've done in maritime regulation, um, research in that space on the transport of coal in ships, um, noting that most of the coal export out of Australia is in ships, um, and that's under the International Maritime Organisation requirements. So we've, we've uh, led the charge in that, and a lot of nations have just sat back and watched what ACARP has done. Uh, um, AMSA, Australian Maritime Safety Authority from Australia, they sit on the IMO and a couple of the uh, ACARP guys went to the committee meeting in London in September and uh, we've been doing some research on spontaneous combustion, the code for spontaneous combustion in shipping. But the other part of the tech market support is on, um, on the beneficial use of coals, whether it's coking coal or thermal coal. And... Uh, now, we use that to assist in the promotion of those coals, the higher energies, the, the better qualities of Australian coals. And we try and do that with benchmarking where we can with international coals. Um, and uh, also just to allow um, the results speak for themselves. Um, so we do a bit, a bit, a little bit in that. But um, we go into the open cut area. Looks like a nice pizza. Um, we spread fairly evenly around the topic areas, whether it's environment and, and appreciate this. Some probably the, the drill and blast area, that's a lot, a little bit here at UQ, but quite a number of projects at um, I think it was three in that five at mining three. Um, they've been developing a alternate to uh, ammonium nitrate, uh, hydrogen peroxide based explosive. Uh, we've spent probably three projects and three former projects, about six yeah, probably two and a half million dollars in that space. And I know when they first were seeking that, I expected to see the blast crew have, you know, peroxide coloured hair, you know, but, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, we've had that same chart from uh, 25 years ago to be pretty heavy in uh, overburden removal, um, health and safety, um, and uh, yeah, geology, geotech. But probably not so much in environment um, and uh, a little bit in drill and blast. So, yeah, our priorities change. Um, coal prep, a fair bit in, like, say, fine coal flotation, um, uh, you know, hub of excellence here in that, that space. Dewatering, um, uh, including in that is some tailings management, um, a bit in process control. And again, uh, um, we, we highly regard and uh, we get research requests from UQ in those spaces. We, you know, we've got a great track record and that counts. When, well, I can't say it's a tip, but that's one of the benefits, I suppose, of continuous work in that space. Uh, underground, um, you know, there's about 10 in that project, strata control, geotech area, a um, little bit in, in other spaces. The environment's probably more to do with, I think, subsidence and ponding of waters and things like that. I've got my eye on the clock up there. Tips. Um, 
Yeah, we, we put a fair bit and we're putting an extra effort in at the moment on our priorities and our strategies. So when you get that document, you know, look at those and we're going to try and change maybe the font size on what the key priorities are. Um, but sometimes we often get the research as priority. We might say, well, that, that was fine maybe five years ago and you're adding another layer of information and knowledge. That's fantastic. But we've moved on. We're, we're now to, over here. Um, engaging with the industry is um, often well regarded, um, whether that's with the committee or the monitors, um, particularly if you are for another stage of program research. Um, with coal producers and that, you know, um, if if you haven't got those those uh, that network, then then I can I can help by saying, well, talk with this guy who works for Glencore or BHP or someone like that, because uh, getting yeah, you, know, you don't need to have site based research. Um, quite a bit of our research is in that space, but quite of our research is fundamental. It's often in 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 an environment like like at the university. Um, but if you say you're going to do site-based research, um, yeah, we, we often question, well, have you engaged with a site? Because sometimes a site might say, well, you, know, you might want to come to Collinsville, but we don't want you. We, we can't say so sorry. Um, so have that sort of support. Um, yeah, has the research been done before? Um, you can get access to our... Um, to our uh, uh, databases and or our, our, our research, and, and you can go check and say, okay, well, I'm now building on one plus one equals two. Um, and yeah, the the need for complying with that short proposal, and I think everyone's doing that pretty well these days, is is just because, as I said earlier, we get 250 of these, we carve them off. The underground committee gets 100. They got their day job, and they're trying to trying to you know, colour code and put stickies on the top and say that's a good one or I, I can't do that one. Uh, long proposal, um, yeah, it's a business case. So you're competing and not every long proposal gets accepted. You've seen that. Um, if it's a large project, we'd like to see it sort of staged. So they say, oh, I need $10 million for this because we're not going to give you $10 million. You know, so I need I need one to to take it to stage one, and here's what stage two might look like, and here's what stage three might look like. Okay, we like we like to see that. Uh, cost is important. Um, we have had some some concerns. I raised them with Neville um, when I met him a few months ago. Now on some of the overhead arrangements, um, uh, we've seen an uplift in that from UQ. Um, it's probably more an administration matter, but. Um, you know, if there's only so many dollars and 30% and is going to an overhead, well, we want to understand that a bit better. That was sort of the conversation. Um, collaboration, I think I talked a bit about that. And, um, yeah, the success of previous research, that's acknowledged. Doesn't It's not a pathway to, to get it, but if we see that uh, that quality that's come through, the timeliness of reporting, all that, we know that, that that researcher can deliver, so that's that's also important. Um, I might pause there because I got a little bit to talk about on coal if you've got time, but I'm looking at the clock up there and there might be some questions from the floor. Well, I have heaps of questions. I'll let others go first. Um, in this case, I'll go first. Okay. <laughs> Um, is there a sweet spot, sort of magic number for a budget? So when people ask for a certain number, um, you kind of prefer? Not really, Katarina. Um, I've, I've noted in the past that, and I've, I've done this analysis, um, in the coal preparation area, a couple of years ago, it, was, it looked like it was two years and $200,000. <laughs> but... Uh, out of say fifty or forty or so projects, but um, yeah, no, we're not. We're not looking for a sweet spot. I said it, it's if we if if a researcher like a researcher wanted seven million dollars this year for some, um, sorry, wanted ACARP to provide about two million dollars, and they had substantial in kind support and cash for about total about seven million. Not wasn't this university. Um, and 
we felt at, at committee level that um, we were very interested in the project, but we just, I, I just wrote a, a, a letter the other day for $100,000 to do a literature review. Mm -hmm. We wanted to know more because it was a big commitment and it was going to be a five-year program. And we thought, well, let's understand that a little bit more. So we went back to them and said, like, like what you're telling us, mm -hmm. but we just feel a little bit uneasy at the moment. Um, um, I said the other day, CSIRO, we, we awarded two and a half million dollars for a project over about three years. Stage number of, in, in underground uh, uh, roadway development, long wall automation. Um, again, they, they ticked a few of the boxes down below. Great research. It was an extension of existing work that delivered some, some significant benefit to industry. Um, and um, we felt very comfortable in, in giving that organisation that amount of money over that time. So, yeah, it's track records are very important. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. It was a great talk. Um, just curious, um, a couple of things. In terms of um, research that you do and say there's IP involved or new, uh, what's ACOP's uh, position on on that? And do, and, and if I uh, may ask, this, uh, just another one on that one. Um, uh, I note that you mentioned you, you fund a lot of CSIRO. Uh, it was surprising given CSIRO as a government uh, organisation. Is there a reason, I mean, other than they're doing good research? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'll take a CSIRO one first. Uh, CSIRO's got some great facilities out here at Pullen Bale and a lot of researchers, I suppose. Um, and, yeah, we've done uh, quite a bit of research with them in that long wall automation space, and, and I'll come back to the IP in a minute on that one. Um, and uh, mine side greenhouse gas mitigation, fugitive control, so they've got quite a, quite a good organisation. Um, and... Yeah, just like I say, they, they're typically neck and neck with the UQ organisation in terms of our, our funding. And it's not because we're all based in Brisbane, uh, I don't think. Um, we fund about 17 universities across Australia, so in Hobart and West Australia. So we're not, you know, most of the coal is produced, it's in a chart a minute, uh, up the East Coast. But uh, yeah, Adelaide's doing some great stuff in uh, geomechanics, um, Monash is doing stuff in that space. So. We're, we're agnostic in a sense, um, but yeah, sorry. On the IP, yeah, great question. The IP belongs to the researcher. Um, we have basically two forms of agreement. One's what we call our fundamental agreement, and the second one is an applied agreement. The applied agreement's got a couple of extra clauses in it, and it's generally we, we move from a fundamental to an applied. Uh, if it's a stage program, sometimes I say that's applied straight up. Um, the product of the research, as far as ACARP is concerned, is knowledge. And that knowledge is encapsulated in a report that the researcher completes. And that report is made available on our website to all the producers free of charge because they've paid their, their dues along the way. And yes, it's a pooled funding model. So uh, a coal mine that might be an open cut coal mine is not too interested in long wall automation. But equally, there's something in open cut that the long underground guys may not be interested in. That's the model. Um, and um, by sharing that report to the producers and the way we push that information out to the producers uh, allows the producer to say, okay, I'm really interested in what UQ has done in that space. And uh, UQ, let's say it was going to be a product, a, a widget or something. Uh, UQ has, you've got your own IP formulation, you know, JK Tech, all that sort of stuff. Um, so ultimately you might issue a license or sell the, sell the research to someone, the IP to someone else. Um, we're quite interested in that. And with that CSIRO, long wall automation, uh, in the applied agreement is is a clause around a royalty back to ACUP um, for the use of that. And that royalty is, is, is very small. 
Oops. I typically might get um, from a couple of projects fifty thousand dollars a year. We don't. We just want to have that in there to, to promote getting to that next stage of commercialisation. I can't fund commercialisation, so I've got a line there where I say, please try and get it to product to market. Yeah. You got a question right at the back? No? Uh, yeah, I actually was going to ask a similar question here. Um, I, I tried to do a short proposal and um, the issue of IP came up and the person who was my contact didn't have the same perception you did. He, he was sort of saying, oh, if they can't pay for it, why would you commercialise it and get us to pay it again? You know, and uh, it was a bit frustrating because I had no clarity yep. on what the IP conditions were. To follow up on that question, um, what happens to the people who aren't, who haven't supplied the royalty? It's no... As in... Oh, they just don't get reports, but they can still get any benefit in terms of commercial outcome, can't they? The researcher? No, no, no. The coal, coal, coal producers who don't support ACAP, they're not in any way ostracised other than the fact that they don't get the reports. No, there's only one or so company that doesn't pay me a lot. Only one or so. Yeah. Okay. One, and there the, a bit of a there, aren't they? The second one at the, the, second one at the moment, which was, um, I'll use their name, it's public, uh, Griffin Cole, they're in receivership. So oh, I can contact enough. the receiver and go, hey, I need five oh, cents. I'll set some rights. I need, <laughs> I need five yeah. cents. <laughs> they said they need a lot more than five cents. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the other question is you, you said engagement with the coal. But the cold turkey situation where you have a sort of an idea, but you don't necessarily have contacts, is there a mechanism to enable that or you really left your own devices? Um, well, I think from a university perspective, you've got a collegiate of people who are playing an ACARP. So there's that, that's your first probably base. Who do you know at ACARP? I oh, know what, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to do some work in underground. Oh, Harry in, uh, in the mechanics department, he's doing some work in that space. So you've got the internal university network. Um, happy to reach out to myself and say, I, I need some support from industry. Um, I would steer you to. Um, probably one of the co-chairs of the field of interest was coal processing or environment or whatever, I'd, I'd find someone. And so if a chat if someone's got an idea, he needs a bit of a leg up on putting a report together. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any more questions in the audience or perhaps online? Got bear with me for about four minutes to talk about coal. I'll go through these really quickly. These are public available slides, most of them, um, from the uh, department in Canberra. Um, sorry for cutting off Western Australia, but uh, there's a couple of mines over there, one being Griffin. Um, um, a little bit of mining in Tasmania for coal. Um, so I've got coal mines that produce 20 million tonne a year, and I've got coal mines that produce... 50,000 tonne a year, okay, big, small. There's about 90 operating coal mines, black coal mines in Australia. Those numbers uh, are already dated, particularly the first one with the very high price of coal at the moment. Um, and probably the one down the bottom, the royalty figure is going to be a lot more with uh, what Queensland government did recently. But uh, about... Uh, 400 million tonnes of coal, for uh, ex uh, 400 million tonnes of coal exported and about 50 million used domestically this is the Australian landscape. Um, coal for steel, for cement, a lot is used for cement. Um, Australia is primarily in, in the black coal space. So we get a little bit of anthracite. Brown coals, Victoria, we don't do the research in that space. Um, but some of the other coals around the world are, are that sub bituminous uh, space. Met coal, um, steel making coal, there's a lot of companies trying to call themselves now. 
Australia is is the world number one um, exporter of metcoal, has been for many years. We have some of the best resources close to large efficient ports and close to the marketplaces of, of China, India, et cetera. Um, so yeah, um, dominant, dominant position. Um, and our steel production, we produce very little steel. Wyala and Port Kembla. Um, and I'll talk about steel in a, that's, um, Australia doesn't figure on that. So European Union, India, Japan, et cetera, uh, about 36% of the global steel production across those seven or so countries. Uh, that's the same picture and that's China. There's a lot of talk about China and, and all of this, um, but yeah, China, um, more than half of the steel production in the world. So in China, burps a little bit on steel production that affects um, a few countries. Thermal coal, um, Australia is the second largest exporter of thermal coal. Indonesia is the largest. Um, our coal is, is uh, higher in energy and lower in uh, moisture content. Um, again, coal mines uh, up against the coast. Um, even though they might be several hundred kilometres from the coast, when you're talking about some of the places in the United States and whatnot, they're thousands of kilometres from the coast. Um, that's the department's uh, projections. Um, so they still see a um, uh, little bit of growth going forward in, in uh, coking coal or met coal and fairly, fairly flat in the thermal coal space, but it's not sort of falling off the cliff um, now those figures might change, but they're, they're March's figures. Um, what's happening, and there's the projections going forward, and I put the question marks on Russia, obviously, with the, the conflict in the Ukraine. Um, uh, will Russia be able to export some of those coals with embargoes? And, that, and that's primarily what's been driving the price of Australian coals. But you can see Australia is um, in the met coal, and you can see Indonesia in the, in the thermal coal. Uh, but Russia is, is a major producer in the energy crisis in, in for gas and coal in Europe with the Ukraine crisis is um, causing a lot of lot of instability. My concluding comments, um, the ACARP is primarily around assisting the coal industry, um, support sustainable mining practices. Um, and uh, I think I've Going through our funding model, it's pretty robust. Um, I didn't say that ACRL is myself and a part-time accounts clerk. Uh, I've got, uh, you probably know Patrick and Anne from uh, ARA, they often use the word ACARP. They, with Nicole, they provide administrative support to the program. And uh, uh, people like Nerida uh, is one of the research coordinators. There's about four or five of those. And, um, there's a team of volunteers from industry. So um, we keep, keep it fairly simple. We've got something pretty simple. And yeah, we've, we've got a long, long association. I know Neville told me a few years ago that um, uh, when there was a bit of a dip in, uh, in uh, um, I suppose, requirements for universities and funding and whatnot, um, ACARP's um, funding for UQ was, was very well received. That's me done. Thank you. Yeah. Again, for a fascinating talk. Do we have any more last minute burning questions? Thanks, Steve. <laughs> oh, I said that one earlier. earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually watching you. I was online and, okay. and then came in um, yeah, late. So uh, I, I noticed in, in a, a lot of the the, the breakdown of the stuff that you are funding, there's very, very little on the community side. And is that because there's another organisation out there that supports that or or are, are you looking to increase that? We, we do a little bit in that space. Um, and I, I challenge the committees from time to time as part of my role, I suppose, 
um, because often uh, in our committees, we'll have uh, geologists, engineers of various color, mining, geomechanics, um, civil, et cetera, um, health and safety practitioners, environmental practitioners, but we don't have many community people. So that, that voice doesn't quite get heard sometimes. Uh, having said that, we have funded some projects in that space. Um, and uh, a, key, a key requirement we ask, and I often ask as well, is what's the research part? If it's doing community surveys and whatnot, I know the uh, Minerals Council of Australia, I know the Queensland Resources Council do a lot of that polling. Um, and yeah, that, that is research in, in a way. Um, but we we rely on those organisations to do that because they might have a particular need for that. Um, and then you have you drill down into a mine site who might be going for a um, EIS and they need to understand all the stakeholder requirements and all of that. Well, that's that particular mine site's problem. It's not an industry issue. Um, so yeah, we we sort of try and cut it in in those in those areas. Well, on this note, I think Nick. Oh, somebody. Okay. Uh, just a very, very good one. Uh, getting to the, the more than black coal, because, um, you know, in the petroleum space and in the brown coal, I don't know what you would call it, um, seems to be um, another source and, and same sort of problems, I would have thought. Um, and, and isn't there an opportunity there to get into that? That's in work. Into the brown coal? Yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose that goes back to the history of um, you know, under that NERDIC program, it was sort of black coal research. There was there was also brown coal research. Um, it was, in, in those days, it was probably um, State Electricity Commission of Victoria that owned most of those mines. Um, since then, they've sort of been spun off into different organisations. Uh, when ACARP was formed, um, yeah, we focused on that black coal and, um, yeah, if I went and knocked on the door and said, um, uh, would you give me some money? Um, they may, because some of the issues are, are the same. Um, one, one of the benefits of, of ACARP to the large coal producers here in Australia, and I'm now talking of the, the multinational producers, um, yeah, and, and they also cross commodity. We've done a lot of research that is funded by the black coal industry in Australia. Um, and I'll use, come out of this university, uh, Ground Probe. Um, I think we funded 15 years ago, it might have been 150 grand. And, um, you know, developed their first radar or whatnot. And I think Anglo might have helped in site visits and all that sort of stuff. And that little acorn then grew and grew and Ground Probe then started selling products to Chilean copper mines. And now they're doing underground and... A couple of years ago, I reckon bought them for $100 million. That little acorn grew from here. Um, that's a really good segue. Uh, have you tracked return on investment? Or, and, and are those figures available for us to actually get hold of? No, I, I, I don't track them. Um, I, I, I can... Pick certain examples like the ground probe one, and and sort of follow its storyline like like I've just just described. Um, we do have a a weakness in that for, if a particular research project develops a product, well that that's that IP question as well, and there's there's often a, a several years delay, and we've moved on the researcher. Might have lost contact. I mean, we did some research with an organisation called um, Joint. I say saw. They were, they were putting on wearable detectors to look at people you know, shoveling or, or bending and twisting. I caught up with the guys a couple of months ago, and um, they're selling a lot of their product overseas. They're selling it to Australia Post and whatnot. A little bit in the coal line, but that, that's fantastic. So we see a lot of that, but to I can only really do it backwards. If I know a product's out there, then I can try and trace it. 
Um, yeah, you guys might do some research and ends up in your um, in your IP department here, and that's competing with medical research and agricultural research, and maybe it surfaces uh, a couple of years later, or maybe it's sold on to X, Y, and Z, or licensed X, Y, and Z, and they market it, and yeah, that's that's a bit of a not a weakness, but it's a gap in our understanding. Thanks everyone for such an engaging conversation and participating today. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, thanks for uh, finishing up our year of seminars, um, but we have our two ladies here known as Special Ks who have uh, been helping us out uh, all year. So Katerina and Karina here, um, we have something small for you. Uh, just to say thank you very much for putting in a great effort and uh, just remind us to everybody else that there will be two vacancies for personal growth for 2023. So here's something to either brighten up your home or your office. So thank you very much for a great job and putting in a phenomenal effort in 2022. Thank you very much. Cheers.